builds with it that I can uh, that can accommodate my production. Um, and the, the, that's why, I mean, working as fast as possible just to keep the creative flow going because it's very easy to just fall into that, you know, stale, you know, routine where you're just plugging things in one by one, try to play as many instruments as I can and um, on, this, on the productions themselves so it feels organic and live. Love it. Um, is there is there like a favorite instrument that you have could be virtual or real and why? I guess the human mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I don't really have a fa- no. I don't really have a favorite instrument. Uh, maybe the MIDI controller because it's every instrument. I don't really have a favorite one now because you know I'd say the most basic is your voice. And luckily, I've you know I do a lot of I can you know I've been beatboxing for a long time and making lots of different noises. So uh, it's easy for me to you know as a even just have fun with hearing the ideas just vocally first. I think Timbaland talks a lot about that in his uh, master class, which I didn't watch, but I know that people who had seen it said that one of his techniques is that before he produces anything into the computer or records any synths, he sings everything. He just goes, he just sings and hums what he hears. So it's like, (laughs) you know, so he'll put it all there in vocally because that's where he hears. And then he'll find the sounds that match the noises. He'll layer all his vocal sounds and then, you know, substitute those sounds with real you know, uh, analog sounds and digital sounds and stuff like that. But I want to make sure it feels right. And using your voice to do it is, is the best place to start. It's right there. Awesome. Uh, I'm also, you know, also, you're also a bass player. Do you mm-hmm. think the bass has any influence in your, uh, in your production techniques? Does the, yeah, of course. You know, I always try to give it its little sweet spot, you know, and make sure that the bass lines, uh, I don't have like a rule about it that the bass has to have some sort of feature. I do what's best for the track and, right. you know, but at the same time, I definitely think being a bass player gives you an advantage of, you know, being able to keep things really interesting, unique, but also subtle because you kind of, you're understanding, you know, a lot of the fundamentals of what's going on uh, as a bass player. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it makes a big difference in a very subtle subconscious way where if bass lines are interesting and you know how to work your uh, your kicks in your bass and mix them right and do interesting patterns and rhythmic patterns, you know, you, you get a way more enriched track that way, even if it's not apparent that all this other fancy stuff is going on, which is the obvious stuff. You know, you hear pe- people who kind of wing it on the bass because they, you know, they're just doing what they can, but, you know, they're hitting root notes and simple things. But it definitely makes a difference when you can put something subtle and interesting into the track. And being a bass player gives you that advantage for sure. Yeah, I, def- I definitely feel that way also. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you do specifically in your productions that you think gives you a trademark sound? You know, I don't know. Uh, that's for other people, I guess, to decide what my. What my trademark sound is, I don't know. I'm just doing what I can and doing what feels cool and what I like. And I'd say that the combination of learning the techniques, you know, to allow yourself the maximum flexibility of whatever you hear in your head um, is the most important thing. The only thing I can do is just to keep learning, keep expanding my knowledge of production and even the tools at my disposal. If I see I'm part of all these user groups and stuff that I have gotten involved in that are sharing new plugins that come out and new types of sounds and new techniques. I'm always watching tons of YouTube videos and other producers and seeing what the latest cool techniques are. So I'm hoping that in the combination of all of those things and all those elements that I have at my disposal that I'm trying to incorporate in my productions that, you know, you inevitably get something unique. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's been like the common the common theme of that question is that people other people will decide what your trademark sound is and you might not even know what it is. Yeah. I mean, I do what I do and whatever feels cool. And I, you know, the band has definitely developed its certain sort of style and, um, you know, in that indie folk pop realm. And I definitely have, you know, certain styles that I, I'm, you know, confident I know how to create or get close to because I've been challenged to do that over the years doing commercial music where you have to really listen to how this stuff is done and, you know, even just Google searching how certain vocal chops and techniques are made on various tracks because you want to accomplish that sound for your track. So I'm just constantly learning and expanding my, uh, you know, repertoire on how to create all this stuff. And then when you get to that point where you, you know, you're just kind of, mimicking everything else that's out there in a good healthy way just taking in all those influences 
figuring out how those things happen. And then when it comes to your stuff, when you get to that point where you don't have to think about it, you just do what is coming second nature or what you're hearing in your head. The combination of all those influences will give you something that's your own. And that's, that's how it all generally works. You can only sound like you eventually. Yeah. So how do you balance uh, your creative vision with those of the other members of the group? You know, like I said before about trust and respect, I mean, if I feel really insistent about something, you know, everybody gets a chance to uh, uh, get their ideas heard. Rick Rubin, I think, had said uh, something along the lines of like, he doesn't knock anything until he hears it. So someone can describe a direction that they want to take an idea uh, and, you know. Uh, before he shuts anything down, he'll just say, you know, well, let's hear it. So they try it, they listen, and um, then they can evaluate. Um, I would say it's not, you know, you just, you really learn not to get precious about anything uh, with, when you're collaborating. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, you know, um, we all kind of, you know, trust the instincts of each other that if somebody's hearing something, you know, it's worth exploring every direction until you get to something that everybody feels is uh is the right way to go and also being in a trio makes it very easy to be outvoted so <laughs> you know i've been in you know it's kind of a funny thing and it sounds it sounds you know, like a trivial but it's true i mean once two people are on board then you're like all right you know you get on board th too two two on one yeah exactly um, here's a bit of a different question. Most of mm -hmm. us tend to fluctuate between high and low levels of creativity. Do you do anything specific when you need to get inspired? You know, I think I just, I don't know. I kind of balance between forcing myself to do it when you're not inspired is, is good practice to just start. You know, the hardest thing is just starting because oftentimes, yep. you know, you start doing something and then it will trigger trigger, you know, more creativity as you start doing it. But even just committing to... You know, doing a little bit of something every day, which is something I've been recently doing a lot of, um, which is just as a matter of like a system, I'll just open up Ableton or open up Logic. Um, lately, it's been Ableton because I want to get better at that software and I just open it up and I start. doesn't matter what it is. I just start. Put, pick a click, pick a tempo and get going. It doesn't matter what the end result's going to be. I do it for the sake of itself. It's not even to make a track to send out to anybody. And of course, you know, three hours later, you know, I have this whole thing and sometimes I'll film it uh, and then chop that up and put it up on like my Instagram. Um, you know, I started an official account this year of just, you know, music. You know, I have my personal account with family and kids and all that cute stuff. But for my own, you know, content mm -hmm. and in creative content, I started one also that helps kind of motivate me to create more stuff for that. And by virtue of that, I'm I'm continuing to produce on a daily basis, which is, you know, uh, making my chops uh, better at yeah. various different pieces of software. And um, it's improving on that. So I'll film pieces of that and then I'll make – and that's teaching me also how to video edit, which is not related to audio per se. But it's just the idea that, you know, each creative endeavor you do can help spark the next one. So – through the process of producing and then recording myself producing, I'm improving on my video editing and learning Ableton all at the same time. But it just takes starting and getting going. Um, and then sometimes if it's really a slumpy kind of day and I'm not feeling it at all, I'll do other things. There's other things to do, whether it's just practicing on my on practicing guitar or bass. Um, I like to loop and do loop sampling and things like that. So I'll just sit down and do something quickly and, you know. If it doesn't have to do with actual, you know, the grind of production, which can be a grind, you know, just do something else and uh, and take care of all the other stuff. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any go to session musicians when needed? Uh, yeah, sure. I have a bunch of people that um, I will either have come in or uh, I'll send them stuff and they can record remotely, which is great. Um, it's generally stuff that is very hard to pull off via MIDI, you know, solo violin. Or, um, you know, like solo instruments, like woodwinds, solo brass, solo violins that are harder to do. Uh, drums, not as much, not as often. You know, they have a lot of, you know, very programmable stuff and also live loops and things like that. So that's easier to work with and sequence and put together. But the solo instruments, I have my go-tos. And of course, for like female singers, for, for stuff that calls for girl singers and stuff, I have a whole roster of, of uh, great vocalists that have come to the studio for different projects. Mm -hmm. And y you always mix your own work? Um, or is it just usually what yes, happens? Yes, yes. I always mix my own work. Um, but some some of the tracks on the latest 
full length record for the band, we, uh, I mean, I did a lot of like the pre mixing, but just to get a final, um, kind of glue on the whole record, we had a, we had a mixer who we worked with who did a lot of the tracks, not all of them, maybe six out of the 11, something like that. He mixed and we got it all mastered. Uh, given that it was the first full length album we were putting out, we really wanted it to sound uniform and work on all formats and platforms to sound the same. So that was important. Nice. It's nice to get fresh ears on things too. Yeah. Who mastered the record and what, what made you choose to hire him or her? Um, for the mastering, for the mixing, we used Orion Lippman. He's a great mix engineer out here in LA. And, uh, he, I think he recommended the mastering engineer Hans Decline. It just came recommended. It's usually all word of mouth when you're talking to people. Anybody know people, they were, you know, mastering is the tricky thing. You don't want it to ruin anything. So you want the guys who really listen with a, uh, with a adept ear and, you know, you go by referrals. So I think that's how we found him. Um, what's next for Ami Kozak? I mean, I still do commercials on a regular basis. I work with various music houses, um, that are sending me, uh, you know, different, different, uh, jobs to work on for ad agencies and, um, you know, different ad campaigns. So I'd still continue to do that. Uh, the band is going to be playing in New York and Philly at the end of the summer, which is great. We love going to the East Coast. I'm a native East Coaster, so love going out there and 100%. getting friends and family to come out. Hopefully we'll get to Israel sometime in next year. Holler when you do. Absolutely will do. Uh, we have our album that's been out for a little bit and we're still pushing that. That's on a label um, and we're doing work with them to get, you know, to get more traction on the record, which is great. And we've also awesome. been doing some, the band has been doing some great theme song work with DreamWorks Animation uh, on various uh, animated shows that they are, they are producing and developing. And we've developed a really nice relationship with them uh, doing theme song work for kids shows that are going to be coming out uh, one this month and one in January uh, and a few others still pending, but looking good. So, so the band is kind of has multiple lanes going on. We also developed a songwriting workshop called Cousins in the Classroom, where we go to various schools, but we're also going to companies and community centers and, you know, corporates and doing a, a workshop where we write and record a song in one hour. So we take a group like uh, 15 people. Um, 20 people, group of students. We explain to them about the songwriting process, about what we do as a band, and then we proceed to literally write a song from scratch with them in an hour. Uh, we assign wow. them we assign them a mock brief, kind of the, you know similar to the ones that we get uh, as a band for for theme songs and things like that. And we take them through the process, and then we also scramble but we ended up recording and you know showing them a little bit of the production side as well which I'll, I'll have my laptop set up and you know start tracking stuff and we end up with a full song in you know 60 to 90 minutes so that's we, impressive. Uh, we're, we're taking that around the country hopefully within the next year and we're going to be playing cities and touring but also doing uh doing the workshop so we're pretty excited about that and yeah you know that's just doing the grind taking it day by day three kids home studio <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, that's, that's the latest. Awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you'd like to share with the audience? I, I would say, you know, obviously I think, I think production in general, I'll, I'll just say is there's not really a, a divide anymore between um, songwriters, mix engineers, producers, as there used to be. I mean, of course there still are those, those individual people who do those different roles, but Having as much of those skills as possible combined is the best thing you can do for yourself if you're an artist and if you're a producer, getting familiar with songwriting and getting familiar with mixing so that you can do as much of it yourself as possible because all the tools are readily available to you. So the expectations mm -hmm. when you're working with any sort of client, whether it's for advertising or with another artist, you know, having as many, you know, tools at your disposal as possible, um, is so essential for you know, maximizing your potential for success because somebody who knows a little bit about songwriting will definitely have a better session with a songwriter uh, than, than a producer who might feel in the dark about that or doesn't really know. So getting your musical chops up as well as your production and they all, they all kind of work together today, you know, 
So yeah. I would I would my advice for anybody out there is if you're an if you're an artist, a songwriter, you know, learn production, learn recording, start doing it, get a laptop and get logic and get a little MIDI keyboard and start 